Burning. And all right, welcome to the Active Teaching Lab. As you can see in the um, main window here, I've got the activity sheet up, and I'm going to put that link in the um, chat window. This it, it helps if you have more than one screen, <laughs> which I understand that not everybody does. Um, so I will have both the acti I will have the activity sheet um, shining here if, if for a while. And you can see at the very top of the activity sheet, we have sort of an agenda or structure for today's lab. Uh, the theme of today's lab will be uh, universal design for learning, that's UDL, and inclusion in remote learning. So just as a, a, a quick overview of what that means, at least for us, is, or for me, in a face-to-face -face classroom, um, it's often very easy of us for us to scan the participants, uh, our, our, our students, and to see what are the things that we need to do to get everybody engaged. Um, and oftentimes, that one student might be really good at in-class participation. They raise their hand all the time. They talk. But somebody else might be really good. They give really thoughtful answers, but in a classroom situation, they never talk because they have to think about things before that and sort of proofread it. But when they do in, a, in, a, in an online discussion or online forum, my voice is getting sucked. Oh dear. All right. I'm going to switch headphones and let's see, would another moderator like to take over for a second while I do that? Sure, I can talk. This is Morton Gernsbacher. I'm a professor in the psychology department. Um, and I would just pick up that, right, um, as John was saying, I'll that, Even as that I'm, I'm sorry. changing my. OK, I would just um, pick up on what John was saying is that, um, and even in a face to face classroom, we might misestimate which uh, how many students have disabilities. We've collected data on this campus that shows that most of us um, only estimate about half of the students um, who have disabilities and that we tend to overestimate students who might have mobility disabilities because they're using mobility devices like scooters and, and wheelchairs or um, canes and crutches and underestimate the students who have psychiatric disabilities like anxiety and depression um, or chronic health conditions like lupus or Crohn's disease uh, because those are the quote unquote invisible disabilities. Um, and so in terms of thinking for me, what I've been thinking about a lot in terms of moving to remote learning is going back to kind of some of these basics of building in um, universal design in terms of scheduling, in terms of we'll say flexibility, um, and issues like that. And since I still have the microphone, I, I, I will, um, I want to mention one thing that has really become very salient to me um, just this um, summer. Um, I'm getting ready to teach, um, to co-teach one and teach um, all on my own two um, of our uh, psychology courses. And it, it, one enrolls 200 students and the other two enroll 100 students. So I'm Got a lot of students working, working with this summer. And um, I think even students might be a bit confused about the flexibility accommodation. And this is just, I've had this aha moment um, this um, summer about it. And um, as brief, as succinctly as I can say this is that um, Many of us understand about extended time that if the class, if, if everyone else in the class gets 65 minutes to take an exam, extended time might be time and a half. And I think students and also some instructors are confused about the flexibility accommodation and they think, okay, well, if everyone has a deadline on Monday, students who have flexibility get the deadline the next Friday or something like that. But that's actually not the flexibility accommodation. And if one even goes back to read the McBurney, um, flexibility letter, um, reasonable extensions is just one of multiple 
recommendations. And the primary recommendation is to develop an a plan and a schedule. And that's good course design. That's good universal design. Another recommendation is to break a large project into smaller components. Again, amazingly good course design, particularly for remote learning. Um, another recommendation is to maybe merge two smaller projects into a larger project. So the opposite of that. Again, good uh, recommendation for remote learning. So I'm, I'm excited about thinking about um, universal design in remote learning because I think it underscores and it and it um, accentuates and uh, dovetails with what we think about what good course structure and course organization and course planning looks like for remote learning. And that's what's going to um, help uh, with, for example, the flexibility accommodation. John, I can give it back to you if you'd like the microphone. Now you can hear me. Is the mic better? Are you able to hear me? Thank you, John. Um, all right, cool. So on the screen now, um, I think Martin shared these results. Uh, so having universal to I've got all I will put my photo and video and maybe JT, uh, JT had to leave the session as well. Karen, can you add a can the whiteboard, please? Oh, you want a whiteboard? Okay, Karen. Never know which Karen you're talking to. John, I don't think we can hear you unless it's just me. Nope, we can't. Okay. John, why don't you type in what you want people to put on the whiteboard? And we can work on that. Okay, he's, re he's reconnecting. So if I knew what he wanted on the whiteboard, I would say that. <laughs> <laughs> he wants well, us to put I'll, I'll why? the time. I'll, okay. I'll the time well, here. Sure. Sorry that that's I jumped fine. in and went straight to flexibility, uh, because, but that's just something that I've been thinking a lot about is um, our misinterpretation of flexibility. And I think um, that, that if we really grapple with what actually, what, what building in bona fide flexibility is, and, and it's things like uh, getting a good schedule. It's things like um, chopping huge projects into smaller components. It's things like wrapping around super small components into more more bite-sized and manageable components. But it is also thinking about are there some reasonable extensions and um, that would have to depend on everyone's um, course in terms of you know do can you really extend this deadline or is this is this content that a student needs to know in order to be able to go on to the next thing um, it's also things like telling and in fact if you look at the McBurney letter it's things like letting students know how many assignments can be flexed but when flexibility is just not possible so it's not just a kind of a get out of jail free card in the sense that every every due date that the the class has i get another five days or i get another one week i've been seeing that misconception a lot among students and a lot among instructors so I just want to take this opportunity to clarify that. Um, 
back yet. We've been getting helpful uh, recommendations from the group here on what we should post. So if you see that little T tool, there's a text tool. If you click on that T tool, according to the uh, activity sheet, we would like to find out what elements should we dig into today regarding UD, uh, universal design for learning and inclusion in remote learning. So if you could post some of your questions, and then as we have been hearing from Morton, she has a lot of great information to share with you, but we would like to know what do you want to know today? What is what would you like to know? So if you would click on the T tool that's right above, uh, and then you start typing. You can, you can type right in there what you're thinking and let Morton know what you would like to know about today. So I just typed in hello, so it's that easy. Okay. Great. And then what I do is I tend to move things around and what's nice about this tool is you can make things larger. Uh, or smaller, or I can click on one item and click delete. So it's a really nice tool to find out what people are thinking. But be careful, as you saw, the, the limit doesn't wrap, doesn't do text wrapping, so we don't want to get too long. Um, but it does, as you can see, does take a good sentence. Great. So things like, how do you ensure that your course is accessible? How do you, oh, great questions. How do you distinguish accessibility from inclusion? Oh, how do you ensure or encourage interaction? What instructional technologies are available to course designers? So well, that's interesting. Um, and regarding the pandemic, even if no disability, the current circumstances create learning challenges for everyone. Definitely been finding that out quite a bit and hearing that from a lot of people as well. Any other things that you would like to talk about today? Oh. Yes, you can view your course as a student. There's a student view, um, but it doesn't always do all the different capabilities that you want it to do in student view. It, it gives most things, but there's, I don't know about testing for accessibility. There are different tools that we can talk about to test for accessibility later on. So that's a great question. How to be personal and caring which aspect of UDL is most valuable for students? These are wonderful questions. John, do we have you back yet? Or do you want me to continue and have Morton start yeah, to address sure. some of these questions? And Karen, I'm wondering, would you be able to, um, I don't know if I have this control, but if you would, would you be able to group the um, questions? Uh, sure. So be like I a, a, like a Q, in my field, we call it Q sort. Like people do it. In, um, to, to group them, ones that seem like they kind of come together. <clears throat> yep. That sounds okay. great. I'll try um, to do that. All right. Um, let Maybe me you can of... add do this first one, because I think that's a good one, why I'm organizing sure. it. What distinguish sure. accessibility from inclusion? Sure, absolutely. Um, in an ideal world, your course, my course, our campus, every other you know organization physical structures as well as um, um, social structures would be accessible and that would promote inclusion and so when we talk about just kind of back up a step when we talk about universal design in instruction or universal design and learning um, it takes its its cue from universal design in architecture and the fact that um, some parts of our campus, but as we all know, not all parts of our campus are built um, for universal design so that there are multiple ways to access the building that you can um, choose to use the stairs if you would like to, or you can use an elevator. Um, there are, you could choose ch stairs or you could choose a ramp. Um, then there are other parts of our campus, just like around the city and the, and the, the whole country, where um, the universal design has just been built in and there aren't choices. So, for example, curb cuts. Um, most every new street that's built has a curb cut. <clears throat> Excuse me. And curb cuts are an access and access feature and accessibility. They were there because people with disabilities brought lawsuits <laughs> against city planners. Um, but they include, that allows people with disabilities to be included. And it also allows people who are pushing strollers or, or people who are um, walking their bicycle or people who are pushing dollies. And so to the, the, I guess to, to wrap up the short answer to what distinguishes accessibility from 
from um, inclusion is that if our courses and our campus and whatever phenomenon, whatever thing we're talking about are accessible, that allows inclusion. I'll go to the next one, okay. the aspect of UDL that's the most valuable for students. And here I think there's another misconception that UDL is about presenting things in multiple media and um, using, you know, quote unquote, learning styles, which as a psychologist is really tough for me because the science is not that strong about learning styles, even though we all want to kind of believe it, as I do, that some of us are stronger in spatial versus verbal versus whatever. Um, to me, the aspect of UDL that's most valuable is that it helps all students. So when we were talking about the flexibility and the exam and the, the recommendations from McBurney, those are going. Those recommendations are going to help all students. Um, having a schedule, having a, a schedule that shows specifically when things are due, that can't help. I mean, it can't hurt anyone. Um, <clears throat> breaking down large projects into smaller steps along the way, that's going to help every student. Um, having some um, reasonable extensions, saying for this, you can turn this in up to a week late, but you might only be able to earn 90% of the points or 80% of the points available. That's going to help all students. And so to me, the aspect of universal design that's the most valuable for students is the fact that it is universal. It will help, curb cuts help everyone. Um, I have research on captions, and I know that this is a wiki place because we don't want to all ask McBurney to caption all of our videos. But um, the research on captions show that captions help everyone. They help uh, non-native non-speakers who are, are people who are watching the video and this is not their native language. It helps people like me who are in the um, over 60 group. Um, it helps children who are learning to read. Captions help everyone. So that's the aspect of universal design that I think is most valuable, which is, if done well, it really is universal. It does help all students. And coming back to inclusion and accessibility, it deals with equity issues. Because let me just dovetail real quickly back to the flexibility thing, is if people have a misconception that flexibility accommodation is everybody else's deadline is Monday, but my deadline is Friday, that leaves room for a lot of issues re related to fairness. And um, that's a big issue for me in my classes. So one thing that, um, so you talked about captions being sort of difficult to to do, but one of the things that you do very well is um, you have a script. And so mm -hmm. you just can, yeah. you've gained the experience. Yeah, you can hear me now, yay, um, to, to uh, speak well from a script where it doesn't sound like you're reading. And I, I recognize that it probably takes a bit of practice, but once you do that, you've got the script that you can share out to the students so that the students can very quickly scan through. Um, and it, that's got to help make captioning very easy for you, right? Definitely. And I I know that there are mixed thoughts about auto captioning, but if you, to me, my experience has been if I use auto captioning as my starting place, I can go in and clean it up. And I've gotten where I can clean up a 10 minute video in about, I don't know, 20 minutes in terms of captioning. I know that maybe that's the 20 minutes that I might rather be spending as uh, Karen and I were discussing, you know, battling all the mustard garlic in my backyard, but um, it's not two or three hours at least. Yeah, the, the, so we'll talk about captioning in a, in a little bit, but one of the things that I want to make sure that we do right now is let's get into some groups and talk about, we can use this um, slide, the whiteboard, as a starting point, and we'll get into small groups, and we will um, introduce each other, turn on your chat, turn on your video, turn on your mic, get to know each other and say, hey, what is it that we want to talk about? Are there things that you've done that are great, uh, that you found are good examples of that? And are there some things that you've done that, um, or that you wish that you knew how to do better? And we'll come back to that. We can add those to the activity sheet um, and we will um, discuss those things and come up with some good answers based on what everybody else is doing, all right? Um, one of my moderators is going to bring us, set us into groups. I will hang out in the main room 
for stragglers who come in, and we can probably have a couple of people in the main room too if they want. Okay. Okay, I'll start the groups. So I'll make five groups, and I'll put the moderators in that group. So we're going to get started. What time do you want them to come back, John? Um, let's do, let's see, 20 minutes. How about seven minutes? Seven minutes. All right, I'll try to make sure to send a little note to everybody. So look for your chat. I'll send a note so you can know when we're coming back.
Hi, Amy, are you able to hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Amy, you just um, have a few minutes left for the um, group activity that we decided to do. Um, would you like for me? Would you like for me to go ahead and put you in a group, or? Um, how much time is left? Uh, four minutes. Um, sure, why not? <laughs> oh, you don't have to if you don't want to. Um, I'll just wait and see what everyone says afterwards. It's okay. Okay. And in the chat, I'm going to send you a link to today's activity sheet. Okay, perfect. Just so you can, just so you can go ahead and uh, look at that. And you I should have you. perceived it. Yep. Hey, can you, are you able to hear me? I see that you're working ahead. I just wanted to give you a heads up that I've changed assignment three in unit 12. Um, so, you know, just a heads up on that. And it seems to work real well for me. And it doesn't lock me in at all. And I change things. I add stuff and I take things away. But I do try to keep myself within that two week boundary because it's like any deadline, you know, <laughs> as we know from anything. It's the, my deadline's two weeks ahead, not rather, you know, the day that I release the content. All right, and we are back. And I'm going to share out to the 
chat window again, the link to the activity sheet, and say, hey, let's let's address some of these questions that we came up with and share some of the strategies that you've seen or heard or that, that you've talked about um, or challenges or needs that, that you'd like us to talk about a little bit more um, as we as we do this. First of all, I want to give you a, a quick overview of the activity sheet. We have sort of a, here are some basic tips um, on universal design for learning that we have here. Um, it's really interesting, and you've noticed this already, that um, remote learning and online education in general, that it's a different, it's a different ball game um, than a, a face-to-face learning, but the tenets of it are the same. So if you can do something in the face-to-face -face classroom, figure out ways of doing that in the um, online and remote classrooms as well. We've got some more basics of the universal design for learning. And in many ways, uh, the UDL framework per se breaks down to these three things, the multiple means. If you can give people different hooks to get engaged, um, present information so that they can see it in different ways, and then let them give them opportunities to express that they understand it in different ways that are useful for them. So some people are really good at writing papers. Some people are really good at doing projects. Um, Give them some choices. Let them let them lead on that. And more on inclusive learning um, here and uh, presence that we um, is a big part. And it, those themes came up um, in our discussion, and I bet that they did with yours as well. Um, the more that students feel like they're part of a class, the more they can be involved. But it's tricky to um, it's tricky to create those opportunities of for presence for people that you don't necessarily know the situations of. All right. So crowdsourced topics. Um, great. These are getting filled in. And I can add in a few more rows. So if you want to add some other things, you can. Did anyone talk about online tools and strategies that they used? And I should also say that if you have, um, if you prefer to send added links or whatever, use this right column and you can see how people are already adding some ideas. Um, so. Feel free to share any information that you have about that. Um, one thing about using it, using the Google document versus the online synchronous chat, especially in Blackboard Collaborate, is that the Blackboard Collaborate chat is not persistent. So as soon as you leave, the chat disappears as well. And people who come in um, might not be able to see what has happened before in the chat. On the Google document, it's there for people to think about afterwards. All right, so let's talk about design tools for UDL then, since we have some um, feedback already. And we've got the Center for User Experience has some information on that already. And they are all about digital accessibility, design research, design community, and strategy. You can click on that link and find out more. Um, are there any other design tools that people have used? Go ahead, Karen. Or if anyone has any suggestions. I will say that last week we talked about backwards design. And backwards design, I think, is in some ways it's easier to start from the scratch if you have that luxury um, to build these things in immediately. In what ways can you, from the get-go, design your course so that there's opportunities for people to write in online forums, opportunities for people to meet face-to-face? -face. How can you give them agency, multiple ways to give them agency to be participants, active participants, active agents in their learning so that they're not just listening to you and following your directions, but that they take the lead? Has anyone seen any other examples of 
um, strategies or tools that let the students take charge? Yeah, JT. I was just going to say one of the things that we've talked a lot about um, in Active Teaching Hub's entire year um, is about student curated content. So a way yeah. that building in um, opportunities in the course for students to um, do their own research and contribute up, contribute that to the course. Um, I'm thinking something as simple as um, an annotated bibliography or even finding, you know, all the different images that um, you can associate with a project or videos that better explain the content, um, which also can give insight to, you know, different avenues for you as an instructor for materials using the course, but it also gives a way for students to show how they and their experiences relate to course content. Yeah, so if the students can take the lead um, in sharing examples of course content, in sharing applications of um, of ways to apply the course content to real life situations, um, yeah, that'd be all of those things are, are great. Anyone else have any other ideas? Yeah, go ahead, JD. Yeah, I was just thinking of a comment that someone wrote in um, the document here um, about uh, knowing which students need help but are too afraid. And it just makes me wonder um, as well if, you know, asking students to curate content that reflects their backgrounds and their experiences could also be an uncomfortable position, right? Because for us, it may be easy to talk about our background and to share about you know, our lives, but what's comfortable for me doesn't necessarily mean it's comfortable for someone else. I'm just wondering how, um, what are some strategies to sort of negotiate that where you're not forcing a student to out themselves, but um, you're also trying to, I'm not sure how to finish that sentence. Um, yeah, you it, understand, yeah, yeah you, you don't want to put them in an uncomfortable situation or too uncomfortable of a situation. So do other people have strategies on that? One of the quick ones that comes to my mind is um, using things like Piazza, where the students can have these anonymous um, or anonymous surveys in Canvas or Google um, Forms or whatever, where they can share some um, ideas and thoughts uh, about themselves or maybe about a friend of theirs. Um, you could do it with roles. So assign students to different roles to uh, investigate what are the different things that we need to keep in mind here. Um, what are some different ways that you or your um, or your friends and colleagues, peers, etc., um, might be able to approach this information more usefully? Yeah. All right. And group engagement activities. So we've got weekly synchronous um, Blackboard Collaborate group information. And I want to throw in at this point um, that synchronous is really lovely. When, when we had um, students surveyed from the, um, the Center for User Digital uh, User Experience, Digital User Experience, and what is it? Digital Accessibility and User Experience, um, that the link here leads to, um, they did a, a survey of students, and I think they got like 600 students about the remote uh, instruction. And one of the things that came out very big was the students miss each other. They miss that synchronous element. It was very important. However, I want to put in here right below parent share and after that, um, there is a problem with some syn synchronous learning. Um, Tech problems, as we witnessed today, can really interfere with that. Sometimes somebody's checking in or, or has to take care of a kid or multiple kids or has a job, and they cannot meet at the same time. So who's being privileged and who's being deprivileged in having synchronous sessions? And are there ways that you can balance the synchronous learning with asynchronous opportunities for them. And if you think about that, multiple ways or multiple means 
of engagement, of representation, of expression. Think about multiple being, well, one is synchronous, one is asynchronous. Sorry, John, I thought you were talking to the other Karen before when you said Karen. <laughs> you have to oh, say right. Spader, had, Spader or Skiba. Sorry about that. I had but seen I did your post... microphone on, and so oh, I thought that you would. I, I did paste. Uh, we did check out that checker in Canvas for accessibility. The only negative thing, you have to do it in uh, Rich Text Editor. I wish you could just press a button and it would check your entire course. But unfortunately, you have to go to Rich Text Editor and check each page. But it does show important things like headers, so to make sure that you're you're going in the correct header order or that a screen reader would read it. We had mistakes in our course or fixing. And it does color, but it really isn't appropriate because Canvas has its own color scheme. So the color one wasn't right. as useful, but the header was. But I use this link checker a lot. We just got a note today from a link worked for us because it linked to another course. So for us, it worked. But Canvas will email you if people are checking a link and it doesn't work. So those are two good tools in Canvas directly. Yeah. And I, and I see that Martin is talking about text-based ch based chat here. And this is, I, I think, a really important point. Um, and if you look at our experience right now, the, the number of people who are participating with text on the document versus the number of people who are participating in video or audio, um, it's really it's significant. Um, people in general seem to be more comfortable typing things in where they can sort of think about things rather than speaking off the cuff, as, as I often do. See, John, I wanted to mention one of the things we, this is Morton, yeah. and I wanted to mention one of the things that our breakout group talked about. Yes, and, please. And, um, it's, you know, you, you, you had also mentioned when you first brought us back to this document about the fact that um, there can be challenges when you take an in-person course to a remote um, structure, an online structure. But I also, I'm such a Pollyanna that I also like to think about what are the advantages? What can you do that you're not able to do um, in a um, in-person or face-to-face -face course and back to the topic of flexibility that I was talking about when we first began today that's when the the world just opens up I believe that's where I think I get as an instructor the most bang for my buck which is that I no longer have to gatekeep the content I no longer say if you're not here Monday at 11 a.m. you're screwed because Monday at 11 a.m. is when I'm giving you content. That's when I'm doing my lecture, and if you're not here, you're screwed. I'm not saying everyone thinks that way, but you know, that's the extreme view. And instead, as you know about my courses, I make the content available even before they register for the course, because I don't want anyone coming to my class who's not familiar with the way it's going to proceed. Um, but at the least, I, I feel adamant with every bone in my body that when we are releasing content in an online course, we should allow students to, to work at least two weeks ahead. That the, the whole notion that, and I just saw an entire thread on this on Facebook, um, on, on doing the thing that gives me the willies, um, from the Society for Teaching of Psychology, where people were saying, what day do you open your each unit? I do mine, I open mine on Monday and I close it on Sunday. And other people were saying, I open mine on Monday and I close it on Saturday. And other people were saying, I open mine on Tuesday and I close it on Monday. And this gatekeeping of online content just makes very little sense to me. I mean, this is not, you know, a video that you're renting from Amazon and you only have 24 hours to watch it. Um, this is where having access to the internet is a plus. This is where we can get, we can work with that issue of flexibility. We can tell students, work ahead, be responsible for your learning. This is not a, you, if you're not there, at that certain day, your life, you know, has, has gone to smithereens. We, we can, in fact, encourage them to learn these good habits where, yes, the content is there. I'm not going to put it off until the deadline. I'm going to do it in advance. But uh, in our breakout group, we were really, you know, scratching our heads about why when people move their course remotely or online, they think they still have to gatekeep it the same way they would be gatekeeping it if it was in person. And that just baffles me beyond belief. 
And that's, I think, you know, the, the your, your initial point of what can be done here that could not be done in a face-to-face -face thing. There's a, a model called the, the SAMR model, and it starts off with, we always start off with, with new, new technologies. How do I do what I've already been doing? And then we say, oh, this lets me do something else. How can I augment what I've already been doing? And eventually, we can get to the point of redefinition where online discussions can look entirely different than face-to-face -face discussions. Being able to um, contribute via an online platform can be completely different than contributing in a face-to-face -face platform. JT, go ahead. Yeah, I asked this question in the chat and I'm just really um, intrigued by it. How, Morton, in your experiences, how do you manage um, student to student community development if everyone is potentially working at a different pace? Sure. Well, um, I they can all see the content. Um, you know, uh, but very rarely, and I've been doing this for, sorry, I'll get back to the, the text-based chat question I promised that I was already typing. Um, everyone can see the content, and I've been doing this for 15 plus years, and I've taught thousands of students. Very rarely has I ever seen anyone who, you know, sat down one weekend and said, I'm going to do the entire course. But the way I do mod, they just, you know, I just don't think they physically can. It would be like doing, you know, um, a month's worth of workouts, you know, on one Sunday, you know, which. Well, yeah, but for yeah, example. Yeah, but, in, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I'm sorry. But there's another piece. Let me let me explain. Sorry. I didn't mean to. I, I wasn't giving up the floor. I was just taking a breath. Um, but <laughs> the way that I do the way that I do um, mod, modulate the, the pace is that where students post their work. Um, there's two ways. One is where students post their work is not available until two weeks before. So I'm using Canvas and the Canvas, the, the content, the what the work is supposed to be, the instructions and the materials that they need to do use to do the assignment is available right this moment. But the place where they're going to post their work um, uh, to their student peers, and I use small sections of 10, is not available until two weeks before. So that's one way I modulate the pacing. The other way I modulate the pacing is that, um, as John knows, because he, you know, he, he's heard me talk about this so, so much, I um, usually use, for a four credit course, I use six, six assignments per unit, and that would be per week in the semester. Uh, for three credit, it's five assignments per uh, unit per week, and that at least two of those assignments require students to engage with their peers. And I tell them, if you're, if you know, if they're supposed to comment on three other students' work and three other students haven't posted their work yet, you have to wait. And so that's one way that they do stay in sync for the engagement pieces, but not necessarily for the work that they can work ahead. And I'm going to paste in here um, an old activity sheet that you shared from a 2017 um, lab right here. And um, that'll help folks get a, a, a chance to sort of see the see what um, Martin was talking about with the synchronous. It was kind of a brilliant way to assign roles to the students and um, keep them involved, as she was saying. So I'm. I'm happy to share that again. Although the tools keep changing, I would say, right? So I don't know if you're still using, well, I know you're not still using oh. that that set of. Um, oh, God. That thing that we used to use off of D2L. Uh, oh, right. <laughs> or or it, right in that one. And I think this or one leads to the, um, this is a Google yeah, Doc once, but Google Doc. I'm sure that that's changed so as well. Fine. And the Google yeah. Doc. One, I think it's still fine. I just missed having the timestamps of yep. um, when, you know, it, when they contribute. And now I'd love to go back to that comment, the question that was when I was describing the how do I keep them uh, build community if I let them work ahead. Right. And, and there was a question during that yeah. that I cut off. That was JT. Yeah, it was the, I mean, I, I posted it in the, chat, it was sort of, I was just confused about, you know, it, I think it's one thing to have students um, access course content, but if they're not able to, you know, if they're waiting on one another to finish an assignment or, you know, someone has done, you know, a whole module in a week, sort of, that was Lauren's question, 
or waiting until the very end. I was just, you know, I'm just trying to visualize and understand how they're speaking with one another and sharing, you know, their own experiences mm -hmm. in the course on such a, um, a staggered rhythm. And so the, yeah. the question that I wanted to follow up with is from an accessibility or inclusive design perspective, is there an advantage or what is the advantage to opening the gates, um, to use your expression, for the design of the course? It's huge. The advantage is absolutely overwhelmingly. If, if you ask me what's the one thing that beyond, you know, uh, yeah, one thing design wise, I would say that is the, the, the biggest piece because that allows the flexibility that we were just talking about. That says you don't have to just be here in this one space or this one assignment, or even if you have a unit that opens Monday and closes Friday, what if Monday through Thursday is when you're a student who has a chronic health condition and you have a flare up, you're screwed. And so what I tell students is if you're a student with a chronic health condition, do as much work in advance as you can when you're feeling good. And it's like money in the bank. It's like money for a rainy day. So I think not gatekeeping the content is the number one way that we can help students with who have who need flexibility and all of our students. I mean, it could be a, 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 a parent with a child who gets ill. It can be, I shared in my small group that I learned this from growing up with the opposite direction, a parent who was ill. My mother had lupus when I was growing up and um, she couldn't predict that next week she would have four good working days. That was just, that's something I just learned as a small child is that it was unpredictable. It's an unpredictable disease and she could not predict that next Monday through Thursday she'd be on um, key to do what she needed to do. So when she was on key, she tried to get as much done as possible. And that's the, the principle that I've brought through. The other thing I was gonna mention, JT, is that you know I use these small groups, even in classes of 200, of 10, or even in classes of 20, of 10 students. And then I break them further into groups of three. And in a group of three, students will suss out the other ones who are work ahead types. And it's it's the reason why people don't like group work, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, there are data showing that if you ask students at the beginning, do you like group work or do you not like group work? And then you put together the students who like group work and you put together the students who don't like group work. The students who don't look like group work are usually the ones who like to work ahead, who end up having to do the work that other people have, have not done. And so those people find each other. And the people who don't want to work ahead, they find each other. And that's where they build their community. I mean, we see that in our day to day lives, don't we? I mean, not to get too personal here, but we all know our colleagues who, yep, you know, give a, a task and they will get it going immediately. Another task, they're going to wait until the deadline, which is totally fine. And we will s s sort ourselves with those colleagues. And that's totally fine to do. All right. Hey, it's two o'clock and um, I think that ending on the be flexible, give your students agency so that they can take charge of their learning themselves so that they don't, they aren't so reliant on you to spoon feed them what they need. Treat them like adults, let them be in charge of that. Um, thank you everybody. On your way out in the chat, I'm going to add a little link. We're gonna to try to take some um, reflections from folks. I'm happy to stick around for the next 15 minutes or so if there are other questions um, and somebody wants to get into a, a, a conversation with me, I'm happy to do that. I invite other people to do as well. Um, but many of you are free to go if you'd like to. And again, if you could fill out that form um, on, on some reflection, that'll help us out a lot. And yes, Karen, if you could stop the recording, we're good.